Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro has called for an investigation into the transnational criminal organization seeking to steal the country's international gold reserves. Presidential candidates have rounded up their campaigns in the Dominican Republic ahead of Sunday's general election. Demonstrators took the streets of Mali's capital Bamako this Thursday to demand the release of abducted opposition leader Soumaré Sisi, missing for 100 days. From the headquarters of Teleso English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south and I'm Katrina Goss. And we begin in Venezuela where President Nicolas Maduro welcomed the agreement reached between his government and the European Union to strengthen mechanisms for bilateral dialogue. And to proceed to a new stage of dialogue between Joseph Borrell and Jorge Reaza. And that is what has been done. I think it is the best, the most intelligent, the appropriate thing to do. And also what corresponds to what we are looking for, that the world hears the truth of Venezuela, that the European Union enters into another understanding, that there be a profound historic rectification of the role that the European Union has played in its relationship with Venezuela. That's why I salute you. The joint communicant signed by Mr. Joseph Borrell and Mr. Jorge Reaza on behalf of the High Representative of the European Union and the Foreign Minister of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. And I ask for the full support of Venezuelan public opinion for this necessary diplomatic agreement and the applause for our people for these steps of peaceful diplomacy. And during an interview with Telesur, Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Ariasa stressed that the Venezuelan government has agreed with the European Union to strengthen mechanisms for bilateral dialogue in order to avoid an impasse in diplomatic relations. The Bolivarian Revolution principles were maintained. There is a commitment to upgrade talks at the highest level between the European Union permanent representative and myself in order to maintain talks in real time so misinformation does not occur, as well as to make the vision of the Venezuelan government clear. In this way, we can correct any kind of differences or disputes regarding bilateral relations and reinforce the cooperation between Venezuela and the European Union, which is strategic cooperation. And this Thursday, Venezuelan Vice President Delcy Rodriguez announced the existence of a transnational criminal organization headed by opposition lawmaker Juan Guaido that seeks to steal Venezuela's gold reserves. The President of the Republic has specifically requested that we keep our population informed about the aggressions of the extremist group of Venezuelan politicians who have established themselves as a transnational criminal organization in order to take control of the assets of the Venezuelan people. Today, as is known, an English judge adopted an extravagant decision on the recognition of the absurd deputy Juan Guaido as the supposed head of state in Venezuela. And the Venezuelan vice president announced that President Nicolas Maduro has requested an investigation into the transnational criminal organization seeking to steal the country's international gold reserves. Today, President Nicolás Maduro, in his capacity as head of state, in his capacity as head of government, has asked that he requested that the judicial institutions in Venezuela immediately open an investigation to determine the criminal responsibility of those who are part of this blatant theft, this piracy of Venezuelan gold. To protect all our people, an immediate investigation should be open, in addition to the international actions that the Attorney General of the Republic is already preparing to enact in the face of this situation. This gold belongs to Venezuelans, not to this band of thieves that intends to pay the United Kingdom for political favors with the territory of Venezuela and with the resources and with our gold. Peru surpassed 10,000 COVID-19 deaths this Thursday, a day after the government began easing a nationwide lockdown in a bid to revive the economy. The number of deaths rose by 185 in the last 24 hours, while the number of people infected has surpassed 292,000, according to recent data from the Health Ministry. Peru is Latin America's second hardest hit country after Brazil. Among the fatalities are 71 health workers and 153 police officers. The Mexican Attorney General's office announced new information about the 43 missing student teachers of Ayotzinapa. 
Attorney General Alejandro Gertz Manero said that a new reconstruction of the crime that occurred in September 2014 had revealed new information about what happened to the 43 students of the Raul Isidro Burgos Rural Teachers College in Ayotzinapa. According to the revelations, the authorities now know where they were hidden, who tortured them and what became of them. The Attorney General confirmed that former official Emilio Lozoya had provided the new information. Esas órdenes de aprehensión solicitadas Mexico's Attorney General Office requested to a criminal district federal judge 46 arrest warrants against public servants for various regions within the state of Guerrero, all of whom are accused of forced disappearance and organized crime. With the beginning of the dry season in Brazil, environmental experts and Brazilian forest authorities have warned that the Amazon rainforest is once again threatened by wildfires. The number of wildfires in the Brazilian Amazon increased by 19.5% in June in comparison to last year. According to data published by government agencies, more than 2,000 fires occurred, representing the worst figure for that month in 13 years. These figures and the excessive practice of deforestation are providing a worse scenario than that of 2019, when millions of hectares of tropical rainforest and animal and plant species were wiped out by the fires. Uruguay has assumed the rotating presidency of the southern common market, Mercosur. During a virtual summit of the bloc made up of Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay and Uruguay this Thursday, Paraguayan President Mario Abdo Benitez transferred the responsibility to Uruguayan President Luis Lacalpú. Since Monday, meetings coordinated by the Paraguayan Foreign Ministry have dealt with the economic and social impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in the region, where the disease has spread widely. At the two following sessions, the Ministers of Economy and Presidents of Central Banks met and the preparatory meeting of the Common Market Group was held with the presence of the Associated States. Circuses in Bolivia have seen empty tents for the past months as the lockdown force shows to close to reduce the spread of the novel coronavirus. When the government announced in March that shows were banned, the Jumbo Circus crew had just finished setting up the tent in Tupacatari, a suburb in El Alto City. We never thought we'd depend on this. For example, welding and making money by welding. I've always wanted to work as a clown to do artistry, to do many things that I have always wanted to do in the circuits. But we have to look for other methods and ways to make money, to generate money. There is no option because we need to eat and earn our daily living. And we're taking a very short break now, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. A large presence of national observers will characterize the general elections to be held on Sunday in the Dominican Republic. Local electoral observation will mainly be the responsibility of political parties, which will have more than 500,000 representatives in charge of monitoring all phases of the process in the 16,000 polling stations across the country. The observers from political organizations will be joined by 2,500 observers from the Participación Ciudadana Civil Society Organization. Regarding international observation of the election, the Organization of American States will send a delegation of 80 people, while the Inter-American Union of Electoral Organizations will send six, and the diplomatic corps accredited to the Dominican Republic will be represented by 20 diplomats. And we continue in the Caribbean, where this Thursday, CARICOM announced over 2,600 patients have recovered from COVID-19 in its member states. In the past week, Caribbean community nations have increased their recovery figures by more than 1,000, and Barbados has joined the group of countries with no current active COVID-19 cases. Despite the total of over 8,300 confirmed infections among CARICOM member states, there has been an effective response to the pandemic. Haiti now has the highest number of active cases at over 4,900. 
to advance in the fight against the pandemic, CARICOM member states thank the African Union for giving them access to the African Medical Supplies Platform, which facilitates the purchase of certified medical equipment such as diagnostic kits, personal protective equipment and clinical management devices with increased cost effectiveness and transparency. St. Lucia has launched the I Am CARICOM Communications campaign, an initiative aimed at increasing visibility and understanding of CARICOM among citizens of the community. The initiative was launched by the Regional Integration Unit in the office of the St. Lucian Prime Minister in collaboration with the Caribbean Community Secretariat. It seeks to engage and assist citizens of the community to take ownership and participate fully in the Regional Integration Development Agenda through CARICOM institutions, its governance structure, policies and plans. In Haiti, the Toussaint Louverture International Airport reopened this Wednesday and expects to receive four to five flights and about 400 passengers in the coming hours. For the next 15 days, all passengers who arrive will go into home quarantine and will continue to be followed up on. Prime Minister Joseph Juth stressed that the airport had reopened under pressure from the Haitian diaspora and for economic reasons, as it was no longer possible to continue to pay employees of the closed airport. Juth also stressed that all airports in the region have been forced to reopen and Haiti cannot be at odds with this movement. The country has reported almost 6,000 coronavirus cases. Guyanese citizens stranded in the United States since the close of borders on March 17th have begun returning home on repatriation flights. My father has a health condition, so I was definitely very concerned about going outside. Um, I feel as if you're around people who have health conditions or they're at risk for COVID, you need to be extra careful, even if um, you may not seem so, people can be asymptomatic. Hurting the rest of Guyanese that, that want to come home. So obviously you should put your correct information to just help out your fellow Guyanese, you know. The Caribbean Court of Justice will rule on July 8th whether or not it has jurisdiction to hear an appeal filed by members of Guyana's main opposition party, the People's Progressive Party Civic, regarding the disputed March 2nd regional and general elections in that country. Guyana's opposition leader, Barat Jagdeo, filed the appeal before the Caribbean Court to determine several issues, including an interpretation of the phrase, more votes cast, in the Guyanese constitution. The Guyanese Court of Appeal, in its ruling late last month, ordered that the words are to be interpreted as meaning more valid votes cast. The appeal against the ruling claims that the decision was wrong for many reasons, including that the Court of Appeal did not have the jurisdiction to hear and determine the notice of motion. Simply for the court to determine the interpretation of the Moscow on Thursday denied allegations that Russia had sold arms to the Taliban and instead accused the United States of supplying ISIS fighters with helicopters. It is well known that Russia has always supplied with arms only the legitimate government of Afghanistan. If American colleagues intend to have a conversation in this context, it is appropriate to mention that information that has been circulated actively in Afghanistan about U.S. Special Services Supply and ISIS, Islamic State Group, fighters with helicopters. We were talking a lot about these helicopters without identification at the briefings a year and a half ago. Several months after the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution on the issue, although divisions remain. The resolution, unanimously approved, reflects the call of the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres on March 23rd for a global ceasefire to concentrate all efforts on the fight against COVID-19, which has already killed more than half a million people. The Council also called on all parties engaged in armed conflicts to immediately commit to a humanitarian ceasefire of at least 90 days to allow for the safe, continuous and unimpeded delivery of vital aid. But the text clarified that a ceasefire would not apply to ongoing military operations against extremist groups and other terrorist organisations as designated by the Council. Japanese health authorities reported a record number of new COVID-19 cases in Tokyo on Thursday. Meanwhile, Tokyo's governor, Yuriko Koiki, called on citizens to refrain from going out to popular nightlife areas and to avoid crowded districts. Today's number of positive COVID-19 cases is 107 people. Under the state of emergency on May 2nd, there were 154 people, but it exceeded 100 people to the first time in two months. Regarding the breakdown, young people in their 20s and 30s are increasing as well as today.
Based on analysis of experts, we are at a stage that we should be aware that we should be cautious about the spread of infection to the citizens of Tokyo and businesses. I hope you will share the common awareness. During the time of business closure, request and state of emergency, I think everyone had to be patient. I think we, we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Demonstrators took to the streets in Mali's capital, Bamako, this Thursday to demand the release of abducted opposition leader Sumailai Sisi, missing for 100 days. Sisi was abducted on March 25th following an electoral campaign activity in the Timbuktu region. The leader of the Union for the Republic and Democracy Party had called for the resignation of Malian President Ibrahim Boubacar. Meanwhile, Sisi's followers have claimed this was a political abduction as none of the terrorist groups in the region have claimed responsibility. Malian opposition leader Mahmoud Diko has called for demonstrations on July 10th to push for government reform, including the renewal of Mali's highest court and the formation of a government of national unity. It's special for us, for the simple reason that we have been without Somalia Sisi for 100 days. 100 days deprived of the lie of our model, of the political balance in Mali that Somalia Sisi has represented for more than two decades. Of course, I'm still hopeful when the President of the Republic says that today Sumaila was spotted. Well, when the President says that Somalia has been spotted, I'm pretty sure that Somalia is alive. Explosions were seen in Sana'a, Yemen's capital and largest city on Thursday after the Saudi Arabia-led military coalition confirmed it's launched a major operation against the Houthi movement. What happened last night was bombing and hitting this store, Oman oil store, and this is what happened in Swar, hit a household amplifier factory. This process launched by the coalition, this is their goal that you see, bombardment of warehouses, factories, and everything vital related to the citizens from facilities, infrastructure, factories, and everything related to the livelihood of these people. Last night, two airstrikes hit us bombing the residential neighborhood and this place, exposing most of the houses to destruction. We have children in hospitals and we have pregnant women having miscarriages. It is a catastrophe and a major crime. They neither consider the place and its sanctity nor the sanctity of the inhabitants. Health authorities in Cameroon have received a donation of 183 medical oxygen cylinders to support the country's fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. The donation was delivered by WHO representative for Cameroon and Rwanda, Fanuel Habimani. Cameroonian health authorities have reported over 12,500 coronavirus cases and a death toll of 313. Meanwhile, over 10,100 patients have recovered from the virus. Schools, universities and training centres have been allowed to reopen following the lifting of an nationwide lockdown which was in place since March. The director of the World Health Organization for Africa appealed to the solidarity of the international community to facilitate the distribution of medicines to treat COVID-19. The appeal comes amidst alleged international reports linking the United States to the mass purchase of medicines considered scientifically effective in the treatment of COVID-19. Dr. Matshi Disomoeti called to rescue the principles of equity in the market in order to guarantee the free and fair access of the global population to medical treatments and to avoid a monopoly over drugs intended to contain the coronavirus. Certainly, we have a distorted global market that really speaks about the need for some principles of equity and global solidarity if we want to solve the collective problem. Because as long as the virus is spreading in no continent or country, the rest are also at risk. Chad has closed universities and schools, places of worship and some businesses to halt the spread of the coronavirus. Although no total lockdown of the capital has been ordered, the measures have been enough to destabilize the fragile economy of the country, which has remained among the poorest in the region. The day after the first case of coronavirus was announced on March 19th, the government ordered a series of relatively strict measures for the entire nation. To date, authorities have detected just under 900 cases and reported 74 deaths. Us to be aware of the barrier measures. We put those hand washing devices. The customer comes in and washes his hands and he has his little meal in the corner. He is alone or a couple. They eat and leave. Then we can say you made something. But as it is now, it's already been a week and there are days that no one buys anything and just leaves. The person says he can't buy a takeaway. 
Locust swarms have devastated parts of northern Kenya. According to local reports, the locusts have now hatched into Kana, Kenya's poorest region, where 20 million people struggle for food. Swarms of locusts have swept through Kenya and Ethiopia since January, devastating fields, pastures and livelihoods. Despite government efforts, the insects have continued to breed in their billions, threatening African economies, which are also being battered by the COVID-19 pandemic. The numbers of locusts exploded in East Africa and the Red Sea region in late 2019, aggravated by atypical weather patterns caused by climate change. So the issue without doing control of locusts now is basically they will form big swarms um, and have the risk of going into the bread baskets, baskets of Kenya in the south um, and that will affect food production um, for the populations and the future of Kenya. These infestations are pretty serious. Kenya 2020 has suffered already quite a lot uh, with floods, of course COVID-19 and now uh, the desert lo locust infestations uh, that we seem to be finding everywhere. Authorities in Botswana have warned of the mysterious deaths of hundreds of elephants in Okavango Delta Department. Botswana has the world's largest elephant population at about 130,000. We have uh, up to, to date 275 elephant uh, carcasses that have been verified. Um, of the 356 that are reported um, in the northern part of Botswana within the Okavango uh, region um, that are due to uh, an unknown cause um, which the government is currently investigating. It's, at this stage it's difficult to really uh, tell what could be the cause of the mortality. We have eliminated from the local labs uh, the possibility of anthrax being the cause of this mortality, but there is still a lot of infectious diseases and, and potentially other toxins that are being still investigated by the laboratory samples that have been done. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but you can find these and many other stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Tellysoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss and thank you for watching.